Think of the people you interact with every day. Would you want to spend a day in a canoe with them? I'm Nathan Mercero, and as a financial advisor with over 25 years of experience, I've learned that the quality of the people you spend time with is a lot more valuable than what can show up in a set of financial projections. And growing up in Canada, I discovered you can learn a lot about a person when you spend a day in a canoe with them. So I created this show where I interview people I find interesting and inspiring. I invite you to listen in and learn from their stories so you can create the life you want, one filled with wealth, wisdom, meaning, and purpose. Well, I'm delighted today to be with <laughs> Kathy Wiseman, who is an expert in the area of family systems and family meetings. Um, Kathy, I was introduced to you through a wonderful mutual friend, Brian Gast, and you in turn recommended this book, Wealth and Families, uh, written by Charles Collier, of which uh, it focuses on helping families discuss and address finances. And there's a, a whole chapter devoted to failing meetings at which Charlie interviews you uh, extensively. So uh, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. Now, how our paths have crossed even to this be at this very moment is pretty interesting because I actually flew in <laughs> to your house here, not literally, but I flew into the airport first and drove to your house here yeah. in Santa Fe. So thank you for your hospitality, <laughs> but, um, and welcome to Day in a Canoe podcast. <laughs> and we're gonna have fun today, I just sense that. Um, if you could give listeners a little background on what family systems are for context, and then we'll start to unpack some of the pieces that are in, pl in play with the family dynamic and how to have conversations and address issues effectively. Let's see if I can do a, a decent job of it. Um, Dr. Murray Bowen, who was a classically trained psychiatrist, when he came back from the Second World War, was understanding that some, family, some people got better going home to their families and while other people regressed. And he became extremely interested in families as the emotional system that surrounded an individual. And he really took the notion that you don't focus on the person, you focus on the system, and that it is interrelated and it's emotional, meaning it comes from part of the brain. It's not the cortical part, it is the emotional reactivity, and that's built into us over generations. What it does is it changes the nature of help. You don't analyze me for all my internal processes, although Bowen was trained as a classical analyst. What you're looking at are the factors that surround your life. So let me give you an example. Um, I had just given birth to my, my second child. My husband, who was an attorney, was going through all kinds of pressure to move back to a family business in a different state. And we, the tension of that business needing him and it focused on tension and conflict in the family. So I have spent a lot of try time trying to change him. A lot of time. And a lot of good psychology and reading books. And I heard Dr. Bowen speak about the system and the system I'm in and what I brought to the system from my multi-generational process. And I changed the focus from trying to change him to looking at my part in it and what I could do. That systems approach has served me well. Now, sometimes I can't do it, but the ability to see one's own part in anything, the emotional reactivity. So I flipped the switch and as I say, I can't do it all the time. But when a, when a family comes with a problem and you look up the generations and you can get one motivated person to change their responsiveness, you have a different family. Now, it's not easy for any of us to uh, go inward. It's much easier to point to people or circumstances as the problem. How do you reverse that, kind of bring the mirror up so that you're seeing yourself? One begins to look at the system that has developed over time. So the ability to see back the generations 
and then a timeline of how does a symptom develop, how does a problem develop, and what you can do about it if you're so motivated is focus back on self. And I think the difference is that you make a research project of your own behavior and you watch it and you see your responsiveness. And as Bowen found out, much of this emotional nature, responsiveness, is what we share with the lower forms of animals, that we are subject to anxiety, which changes our thinking completely. If one can get a handle on that and interrupt that and do it differently, one has a different life. He also looked at the two forces, individuality, the need to do for self and to go forward, and the need to connect. When anxiety is high, people revert to extremes of being alone, or they being anxious. The ability to change your focus on self and the system allows you to act for self, and that's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Huge difference. Now, the topic <clears throat> of money often produces anxiety within families. Right. First question, why is that? Why do people get stressed about this money topic? Well, I can answer for myself. Money means much more than currency. It has an emotional valence to it that represents judgments, um, opinions, and it has a real zing to it. And many times over the generations, money begins to have a certain weight so that it becomes very difficult to talk about the emotion of money and what it represents in relationship systems. And when you can't talk about something more thoughtfully, you are just triggered all over the place. So people are constrained from solving and planning and thinking about money more calmly. They're amped. And this emotional um, attachment to success or judgments about money gets in the way of being able to talk about it. Now, one can almost always trace a history of money and reactivity to it multi-generationally. And I think a family who can begin to talk about it over time openly, the differences, what it means to them, can solve problems that come, come along in the course of any family development. And that includes allowances all the way up to, do you fund a house, do you buy a car, and a will? How do you talk about that reasonably and sensibly when families are really different? And I think it's not about putting wisdom in a family. I think it is helping them think about what they inherited emotionally and what they want to do about it. Some people don't want to do anything about it, and that's a good decision. Doing something about it takes you into wonderful discussions with your family, wonder wonderful discussions with your spouses, and a way to really talk about what's important and what you value. Those meetings are fabulous. I want to fabulous. <laughs> I believe you. I want to frame a, uh, uh, I think, a common case study okay. with a family who has maybe one more dominant member in who's focused on finances. So they research things that have to do with financial topics. They talk about it. They're, you know, they they have natural curiosity about it. But what it does is kind of alienate other family members from feeling safe or feeling comfortable to admit, I don't know something. How would you guide a family like this, where there's that one dominant leader on this topic of money to a more inclusive and balanced uh, parts of engagement? There's a principle that I try and adhere to um, in is to have each person speak for self. 
I and I, I'll give you the logistics and the reason. I often have people speak for self, how they got to something, what they think about it, what they believe in, what they're willing to do, what they're not willing to, just for self. And I have that, and then you begin to see the differences and the similarities. And that, if if you give people a forum to not be interrupted, to talk about what they believe, what they think, you will begin to see questions of one another that are genuine. Now this this is a facilitation skill to allow people to have separate viewpoints and to question each other. Over time, a series of questions to people, genuine, which is, you know, you can get snarky comments too, but the idea to probe what people are thinking does the most for getting them to understand each other, but it's very crisp. I mean, what what are you concerned about with money? What do you value? What have you seen? What are you concerned about? The ability to speak for self in your family group is extremely powerful, engaging, and gives you differences to build on to make decisions. So would this be in an environment where you would provide some questions in advance? Yes. And then everyone would have time to think about the answers and then have a dedicated, uninterrupted time slot to express their point of view. I often have a person, uh, the questions, I have a person come to the front of the room and just talk to me, not watch for reactions, just look at me and talk about what's important, what's not important, the challenges they face. And I often video it and then ask the person to watch their video and answer a few more questions. So it's an iterative process of saying what you think, clarifying it, being re-questioned about it. I think people don't have time to think, especially when they're in relationship to people they're sensitive to. So the goal is to get them to have time to think about what's important to them. And if you get four people in a family, being able to speak for self, you're gonna to begin to hear similarities and differences clearly articulated. It is so strengthening of a family. You know, you say, I don't care about this at all. And you say, I do. And then you can dig deeper into that, not as an argument, but as further clarification. Now. This has worked for me. I am genuinely interested in what you think about money, its uses, how you got there, what are you worried about? What are you I am really interested and I think people pick up on wanting to express to the people that are the most important to them what they think about such a loaded topic. I can see how that really opens up so much right. uh, engagement. So how do you take that level of openness and transparency and then coalesce? Like what, what happens after everyone shares at that level of depth? I ask people to keep going deeper and in their explanation, more precise and you begin to have a picture of where the differences are. And then you look at the differences. How, you know, how different are they really? Is there a way to think about it differently? Or is this the kind of thing where the leaders, and there are leaders who have different levels of decision-making in a family, make a decision. But people know the reason. They've been through the facts of it. and. In the end, the person who makes the decision has heard it and will talk about why they've done this. It is a much more articulated clearly what you think. There's something about saying what you think in front of people who you are related to that can be magical without you know, somebody coming back. Being self with people that you're so sensitive to can be magic.
Is that the gateway to self-identify your contribution, your perspective about whatever maybe a, a challenge or a topic is versus pointing the finger of blame elsewhere? Is you that where it. this gets? You got it. What I try and do is bring in information about whatever topic they're talking about. Mm -hmm. The animal world has a lot of research about what abundance does to other forms of life and what scarcity does. Mm -hmm. Bringing in facts helps people think about it. You know, this notion all the lab uh, rat um, research is fascinating about what happens if you give people, give rats a reward without them having to do anything. And what happens if you put that same rat through a maze and at the end give them a reward? The ability to adapt to new circumstances, they take these rats and put them in water and they turn them on their back. The ones that have had to do something to get a reward can flip over and swim. Okay. The ones that have been given without any action on their part languish on their backs. It's a fascinating study. It's as though having to connect a reward with an action creates different pathways in the brain. If you tell people this, they think, Kathy, you're nuts. But they also think about what giving without return can do to the brain. Money can solve a lot of problems that really thwarts the ability of the cortex to figure it out for themselves. It's a good insight. It's great insight. Do you it, it, take us to the perspective of the family history, generations and generations and generations? How do you advise families to consider or integrate that story into their moment? Some families know their family history very well, but money and the actions toward or for decisions regarding money format what's happening today. One can begin to think about the, how families did, the nature of work, who participated, who didn't, the outcome. How do people choose careers? I think it has a lot to do with family process. There is a lot to explore there with facts. And so part of the process is asking questions about that. They go back and look at their family history and look at the, the, the valence of what money and what money meant, what you do with it. And my family, which was a, they were um, merchants and a grandfather who did not fare well in the Depression. And it had a huge impact on my uncles. Their choice of career, their motivation, kind of their choice of a spouse, but mostly in the way they earned a living and then saw the future. They saw it as dark and bleak and hard to turn around. Now, they had two sisters that had a different approach. So you wonder, how is it? But just knowing that in my family, I have a sense of my own reactivity to money, how hard it is to make decisions when you've got a family history who've made really poor decisions. But, but that's just the format. It just gives me a way to think about it. So I think Bowen Berry does a great job of talking about anxiety and what happens to your brain when you're anxious. And you must deal with that when people, when the market goes down, you know, the level of call, the intensity. My guess is you know exactly who's going to call to say what, when. That is a function of the family process. So but, as we think about the future, and listen, for the listeners that are saying, well, how do I begin this journey? I'm interested, I'm curious. I know that I need to, there's something there within my family dynamic to explore. What would you recommend as the first step or first steps, pieces? And I know there's never a perfect right. formula, but it's more about 
how how do you how do we help people move forward on this topic? I think curiosity is a huge motivator, and not everybody's curious. The author of that book, Charlie Collier, he said, "There's something here that's different." It's about taking the strengths of the family and the weaknesses, and my gosh, we all have them, and building on a way to have an informed process of how you're going to deal with money. And I think it is a conversation is what people are looking for. Um, If they're looking to change somebody else, I would say don't do it. That's really hard to do. But if they're curious about how they can be clearer in what they do with their money now and in the future and how it relates to the family and what they believe, if they're interested in clarifying their thinking, I think a book like this starts and there's a number of Bowen talking about the pressures of being in a family and the goal is to be a self to stand in the family and be a self. It is really, it's really fun. It's not easy. And it's not always easy to think differently than your family system, but the ability to do so, the term is to define a self, to be clear about who you are and not pushed around by the family emotional process is a step toward maturity. So I've just thrown a lot of words, but for me, it makes enormous sense. Enormous sense. Well, I can say that as I have advocated for this book and passed it out to as many people as I can, and if anyone wants a copy, please contact me. Uh, I've gotten nothing but positive responses from people who read this book and consider these topics and take a step forward and it starts to build momentum on its own, which is a very exciting and fulfilling thing to see. Can you say what is the most appealing about it? Most that caught your attention? I think it helps people. So the feedback that I've received yeah. is the, the questions that Charlie poses are rather provocative in a very constructive way. Uh, one of them is, how much money do you leave to your children or your family? Um, many times the default assumption is everything because I love them. But he challenges that premise by saying maybe there's benefits of limiting some of that in terms of what they get to give them that sense of autonomy and independence so that they can discover and achieve things on their uh, own. Going back to your example with the lab rats so that they have a, a sense of pr- a pursuit and reward based on that pursuit. And I think that's uh, been a consistent theme. So I I just want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for allowing me into your beautiful home here on a Friday (laughs) afternoon uh, in in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I'm glad our uh, paths crossed and I look forward to uh, continuing our, our conversations. Can I ask you some more questions? Sure. Among your clients, what do you think keeps people from thinking about this more deeply? So I think um, there's a lot of assumptions that people carry that are most mainly survival based. So they say, I need to have money for these certain needs. And it may be from like you described in your family, past generational experiences. And so they carry that belief system and it while it's constructive it's only constructive up to a point as it relates to the authenticity the transparency about what family and self within family really means and so it is almost like there's this invisible door that people bump up into not really knowing that it's there but it is there and i think that's the limiting factor And I hope to help people just become more aware that there is a a knob on that door to turn and to move through it to to deeper levels of self-awareness and also the family dynamic and how that that ecosystem is constantly evolving, constantly in motion and how 
just by having some awareness of that, you can now see your part in that ecosystem Beautiful. and then how to lean into the curiosity as you pointed out. So, I, I hope that families that wanna understand this or the leaders in the family get excited by thinking about this, presenting it, evolving the, this way that I hope it's a real exploration and that it is um, energizing, yes. that it isn't so laden with worry. That's what I hope to get across. And I know that it, this is not only for families of wealth, this is the ability to share important thinking to a group that's important to you. Mm -hmm. I agree. It's I really agree. fun. How, what's the reaction been? It's been fantastic. I mean, people are constantly, I get thank you notes and emails. Thank you for the book. It really struck a chord. And I think it creates that it's an activator. This book has turned into this activation mechanism to just get people more engaged. Thank you for listening and tuning in to Day in a Canoe. We're thrilled to have you as part of our community. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review and share it with your friends and loved ones. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow us on social media platforms by searching Day in a Canoe. We'll see you next time.